Chapter One of A Warwickshire Lad The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Warwickshire Lad The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare by George Madden Martin. Chapter One Little Will Shakespeare was going homeward through the dusk from Gammer Girton's fireside. He had no timorous fears, not he. He would walk proudly and deliberately as becomes a man. Men are not afraid. Yet Gammer had told of strange happenings at her home. A magpie had flown screaming over the roof. The butter would not come in the churn. And a strange cat had slipped out afore the maid at daybreak. A cat without a tail, Gammer said. Little Will quickened his pace. Dusk falls early these December days, and Willie Shakespeare scurrying along the street is only five, and although men are not afraid, yet... So presently, when he pulls up, he is panting, and he beats against a stubborn street door with little red fists and falls in at its sudden opening, breathless. But Mother's finger is on her lips as she looks up from her low chair in the living room, for the whole world in this Henley Street household stands still and holds his breath when baby brother sleeps. Brought up short, Will tiptoes over to the chimney corner. Why will toes stump when one most wants to move noiselessly? He is pending still, too, with his hurrying, and with all he has to tell. She says, begins Will before he has even reached mother's side, and his whisper is awesome. Gammer says that Marjorie is more than any ailing she is. Now chimney corners may be wide and generous and cheerful with their blazing log, but they open into rooms which, as night comes on, grow big and shadowy, with flickers up against the raftered darkness of the ceilings. Little Will Shakespeare presses closer to his mother's side. She says, Gammer does, she says that Marjorie is witched. Now Marjorie was a serving maid at the house of Gammer Girton's son-in-law, Goodman Sadler, with whom Gammer lived. Mother at this speaks sharply. She is outdone about it. A pretty tale for a child to be hearing, she says. It is but a fear, babe. I wonder at Gammer. I do. And turning aside from the cradle which she has been rocking, she lifts small Will to her lap, and he, stretching frosty fingers and toes all tingling to the heat, snuggles close. He is glad Mother speaks sharply and is outdone about it. Somehow this makes it more reassuring. Witched, says Mother. Tell me. It's lingering in the lane after dark, with that gawky country sweetheart has given her the fever that her betters have been having since the Avon came over bank. A wet autumn is more to be feared than Gammer's witches. Poor luck it is the lubber folk aren't after the girl in truth. A slattern maid she is. Her hearth unswept and house door always open and the cream ever a chill. The brownie folk, I promise you, will pinch black and blue for less. Mother is laughing at him. Little Will recognizes that and smiles back, but half-heartedly, for he is not through confessing. I don't like to wear it down my back, says he. It tickles. Wear what? asks Mother. But even as she speaks, most partly divine, for the finger and thumb go searching down between his little nape and the collar of his doublet, and in a moment they draw it forth, a bit of witch's elm. Gammer, she sewed it there, says Will. A little frown was gathering between mother's brows, which was making small Willie Shakespeare feel still more reassured and comfortable, when suddenly she gave a cry and start, half rising, so that he, startled too, slid perforce to the floor, clinging to her gown. Whereupon mother sank back in her chair, her hand pressed against the kerchief crossed over her bosom, and laughed shamefacedly, for it had been nothing more terrible that had startled her than big, purring, grey Malkin, the cat, insinuating his sleek back under her hand as he arched and rubbed about her chair. And so, sitting down shamefacedly, she gathered Will up again, and called him Goose and Little Chuck, as if he and not she had been the one to jump and cry out. But he laughed boisterously. The joke was on mother, and so he laughed loud, as becomes a man when the joke is on the women folk. Ho! said Will Shakespeare. 
Shh, said Mother. But the mischief was done, and Will must get out of her lap, for little brother Gilbert, awakened, was whimpering in the cradle. Will clambered up on the settle to think it all over. Mother had started and cried out. So, after all, was Mother afraid, too? Of, of things? Had she said it all to reassure him? The magpie had flown screaming over the house, for he had seen it. So what if the rest were true, that the cat, the cat without the tail stealing out at daybreak, had been, what Gammer said, a witch, weaving overnight her spell about poor Marjorie? He knew how it would have been. He had heard whispers about these things before. The dying embers on the earth. The little waxen figure lay to melt thereon. The witch-woman weaving the charm about, now swifter, faster circling, with passes of hands above. Little Will Shakespeare, terrified at his own imaginings, clutched himself, afraid to move. Is that only a shadow yonder in the corner, now creeping toward him, now stealing away? What is that at the pane? Is it the frozen twigs of the old pippin, or the tapping fingers of some night creature without? Will Shakespeare falls off the settle in his haste and scuttles to mother. Once there, he hopes she does not guess why he hangs to her so closely. But he is glad, nevertheless, when the candles are brought in. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. A Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare by George Madden Martin. Chapter Two. But these things all vanish from mine when the outer door opens and Dad comes in, stamping and blowing. Dad is late, but men are always late. It is expected that they should come in late and laugh at the women who chide and remind them that candles cost and that it makes the maid testy to be kept waiting. Men should laugh loud like Dad and catch Mother under the chin and kiss her once, twice, three times. Will means to be just such a man when he grows up, and to fill the room with his big shoulders and bigger laugh, as Dad is doing now, while tossing Brother Gilbert. He, little Will, he will never be one like Goodman Sadler, Gammer's son-in-law, with a lean, long nose, and a body slipping flat-like through a crack of the door. And here Dad bends to tweak the ear of Will, who would laugh noisily if it hurt twice as badly. It makes him feel himself a man to wink back those tears of pain. A busy afternoon this, Mary, says Dad. Old Timothy Quinn from out Welcome Way was in haggling over a dozen hides to sell. Then Burbage was over from Coventry about that matter of the players, and kept me so that I had to send Bardolph out with your cousin Lambert to Wilmcote to mark that timber for felling now for all master shakespeare's big off-hand mentioning thus of facts this was meant for a confession mary shakespeare had risen to take the crowing gilbert handed back to her by her husband and with the other hand was encircling will holding to her skirt she was tall with both grace and state and there was a chestnut warmth in the hair about her clear white brow and nape and in the brown of her serene and tender eyes these eyes smiled at John Shakespeare with a hint of upbraiding, and she shook her head at him with playful reproach. Little Will saw her do it. He knew, too, how to interpret such a look. Had father been naughty? You are not selling more of the timber, John, asked mother. Say the word, Mistress Mary Arden of the Aspies, says father grandly, and I stop the bargain with your cousin Lambert where it stands. "'Tis yours to say about your own. "'Though nothing spend, how shall a man live up to his state? "'But it shall be as you say, although tis for you and the boy. "'He is the chief bailiff's son. "'His dad can feel he has given him that, but would have him more. "'I have never forgot your people felt their merry step down to wed a Shakespeare. "'I have applied to the Herald's College for a grant of arms.' 
the shakespeares are as good as any who fought to place the crown on henry the seventh's head but it shall be stopped the land and the timber on it is mistress mary shakespeare's not mine but mary pushing little will aside clung to her husband's arm and the warmth in her tender eyes deepened to something akin to yearning as they looked up at him with the man of her choice and her children with these mary shakespeare's life and heart were full there was no room for ambition for she was content had life been any sweeter to her as mary arden of the aspies daughter of a gentleman than as mary shakespeare wife of a dealer in leathers nay nor as sweet but she could not make her husband see it so yet and she looked up at him with a sudden passion of love in that gaze it was this big sanguine restless masterful spirit in him that had won her from the narrow restricted conditions of a provincial gentlewoman's life she had looked out into a bigger world for living through the eyes of this masterful yeoman his heart big with desire to conquer and ambition to achieve was her faith in his capacity to know and seize the essential in his venturing less now than then never never not that not that do as you will about it john begs mary her cheek against his arm only is it kind to say the land is mine we talked that all out once goodman mine only this one thing more john for i would not seem ever to carp and fault find you know that don't you but that bardolph he's a low tavern fellow i allow mary of course of course i know all you would say his nose afire and his ruffian black poll ever being broken in some brawl but he's a good enough fellow behind it and useful to me you needs must keep on terms with high and low mary to hold the goodwill of all that's why i am anxious to arrange this matter with burbage to have the players here if the guild will consent players says will listening at his father's side what are players tut says dad not know the players they are actors will players hear the boy not know the players but mother strokes his hair when i told you a tale sweet this very morn you went to playing it after i was the queen mother you said outside the prison walls and you and brother were the little princes in the cruel tower and thus you played you stood at the casement two gentle babes cradling each other in your arms and called to me below so with the players child they play the story out instead of telling it but now these my babes to bed end of chapter two chapter three of a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by bruce kachuk a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare by george madden martin chapter three the next day things seem different one no longer feels afraid while the memory of gammer's tales is alluring will remembers too that greens from the forest were ordered sent to the saddlers for the making of garlands for the town hall revels small willie shakespeare slipped off from home that afternoon reaching the saddlers he stopped on the threshold abashed the living room was filled with neighbors come to help young men girls with here and there some older folk all gathered about a pile of greens in the centre of the floor from which each was choosing his bit while garlands and wreaths half done lay about in the rushes but though his baby soul dreams it not there is ever a place and welcome for a chief bailiff's little son they turn at his entrance and mistress saddler bids him come in her cousin at her elbow praises his eyes shade of hazelnut she calls them and gammer peering to find the cause of interruption and spying him pushes a stool out from under her feet and curving a yellow shaking finger beckons and points him to it 
but while doing so she does not stay her quavering and garrulous recital he has come then in time to hear the tale and the man by name of gosling gammer is saying dwelt by a churchyard will shakespeare slips to his place on the stool hamnet is next to him hamnet sadler who is eight almost a man grown hamnet's cheeks are red and hard and shining and he stands square and looks you in the face hamnet has a fist too and has thrashed the butcher's son down by the rother market though the butcher's son is nine here hamnet nudges will what is this he is saying about gammer his very own grandame beant no witches mutters hamnet to will schoolmaster says so says the like of gammer's talk is naught but women's tales whereupon gammer pauses and turns her puckered eyes down upon the two urchins at her knee has she heard what her grandson said will shakespeare feels as guilty as if he had been the one to say it ay but those are brave words hammy says gammer and she wags her sharp chin knowingly brave words and you shall take the bowl yonder and fetch a round of pippins from the cellar for us here candle la you know the way full well the dusk is hardly fell nay you're not plucking judith's sleeve hammy you are not allowed to want a sister at elbow go now what say you mistress snelling the tale and willie shakespeare here all eyes and open mouth for it too ay but he's the rascaliest sweet yunker for the tale and where were we ay the fat woman of brentford had just come to goodman gosling's house come back and shut the door behind you hammy there's more than a nip to these december gales he faith how the lad drumbles a clumsy lob as you say the fat woman of brentford one gossip pratt by name and a two yards round by common say she was and that beard showing on her chin under her thrummed hat and muffler a man with score o' years to beard need not be ashamed of this same woman comes to goodman gosling's him as dwelt by the churchyard but he advised about her dealings sent her speedily away most like not choosing his words him being of a gendered queasy stomach and something given to tongue for an hour following her going and you'll believe me and i had it from his wife's cousin a come ten year this simple time when i visited my sister's daughter nan at brentford his hogs fell sick and died to the number of twenty and he helpless afore their bloating and swelling nor did it end there for his children falling ill soon after a pretty dears they were i mind them a hanging of their heads to see a stranger and a finger in mouth they falling sick the woman of brentford come again and this time all afraid to say her nay and laying off her cloak she took the youngest from the mother's breast dandling and chucking it like an honest woman whereupon it fell a sudden in a swoon and goodwife gosling seizing it and mindful of her being a witch-woman calling on the name of god straight away there fell out of the child's blanket a great toad which exploded in the fire like any gunpowder and the room that full of smoke and brimstone as none could save us what's that cried gammer what indeed that cry this rush along the passageway will shakespeare with heart a still clutches at gammer's gown as there follows a crash against the oaken panels but as the door bursts open it is hamnet head first sprawling into the room the pippins preceding him over the floor it were a hind me breathing hoarse on the cellar stairs whimpers hamnet gathering himself to his knees his fist burrowing into his eyes nor does he know why at this moment the laughter rises loud for hamnet cannot see what the others can the white nose of clowder the asthmatic old house-dog coming inquiringly over his shoulder her tail wagging inquiry as to the wherefore of the uproar but somehow little will shakespeare did not laugh instead his cheeks and his ears burned hot for hamnet judith did not laugh either judith was ten and hamnet's sister and her black eyes flashed around on them all for laughing and her cheeks were hot 
Judith flung a look at Gammer, too, her own Gammer. And Will's heart warmed to Judith, and he went, too, when she sprang to help Hamnet. Hamnet's face was scarlet yet as he fumbled around among the rushes and the greens for the pippins. And, this done, he retired hastily to his stool. But three-legged stools are uncertain, and he sat him heavily down on the rushes instead, whereupon they laughed the louder the girls and the women too laughed until the candle flames flickered and flared and gammer choking over her bowl for cates and cider were being handed round spilled the drink all down her withered neck and over her gown wheezing and gasping until her daughter snatched the bowl from her and shook the breath back into her with no gentle hand End of chapter three Chapter Four of A Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. A Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare by George Madden Martin. Chapter Four meanwhile will plucked hamnet now blubbering on his stool by the doublet but hamnet turned sullen shook him off perhaps he did not know that will and judith had not laughed but since hamnet saw fit to shake him off will was glad that just then with a rush of cold air and a sprinkling of snow upon his short coat dad came in his face was ruddy and as he glanced laughingly around upon them all he drew deep breaths of the spicy evergreens so that he filled his doublet and close-throated jerkin to their full. "'Good even to you, neighbors, says Dad. "'And is it great wonder the boy will run away to hie him here? "'The rogue kens a good thing equal to his elders. "'But come, boy, your mother is even now sure you have wandered to the river.' "'And Dad, with a mighty swing, shoulders will, "'steadying him with a palm under both small feet, "'then pauses at Mistress Snelling's questioning.' is it true she inquires that the players are coming sandy-hued mistress saddler stiffens and bridles at the question the saddlers whisper says are puritanical whereas there are those who hold that john shakespeare and his household for all they are observant of church matters have still a catholic leaning fond of genial john shakespeare as the saddler household are they shake their heads over some things and the players are one of these is it true they are coming repeats mistress snelling ay says dad and john shakespeare the man to be thanked for it come twelfth day sennight at the guild hall mistress snelling am i to see them dad whispers small will his head down and an arm tight about his father's neck as they go out the door ay you inch promises dad stooping too as they go under the lintel beneath the penthouse roof out into the frosty night the stars are beginning to twinkle through the dusk and the frozen path crunches underfoot on each side as they go up the street the yards about the houses stand bare and gaunt with leafless stalks yes says dad ay boy you shall see the players from between dad's knees and like the old familiar stories we put on the shelf gloating the while over the unproven treasures between the lids of the new straightway gammer's tales are forgot and above the wind as it whips scurries of snow around the corners pipes will's voice as they trudge home but his pipings his catechizings now are concerned with this unknown world summed up in the magic term the players end of chapter four Chapter Five of A Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. A Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare by George Madden Martin. Chapter Five. 
and dad was as good as his word first came christmas tide with all master shakespeare's fellow burgesses to dine and the house agog with preparation no wonder john shakespeare had need of money to live up to his estate for next came the twelfth night revels with the mummers and waits to be fed and boxed at the chief bailiff's door and mary shakespeare said never a word but did her husband's bidding cheerfully even gaily she had set herself to go his way with faith in his power to wrest success out of venture and she was not one to take back her word the week following john shakespeare carried his little son to see the players and was it not as i said mother asked when the two returned did not the child fall asleep in the midst of it sleep laughed dad clapping will so fine in a little green velvet coat upon the shoulder he sleep you do not know the boy his cheeks were like your best winter apples and his eyes bless the rogue are shining yet and trotting homeward at my heels he has scarce had breath to run for talking of it tis in the blood boy your father before you loves a good play and the players too and will blowing upon his nails aching with the cold stands squarely with his small legs apart and looks up at father and i shall be a player too when i'm a man says willie shakespeare i shall be a player and wear a dagger like herod and walk about and draw it so and struts him up and down while his father laughs and claps hand to knee and roars again until mistress shakespeare tells him he it is who spoils the child but for will shakespeare the curtain had risen on a new world a world of giant of hero of story a world of glitter of pageant of scarlet and purple and gold and now henceforth the flagstone floor about the chimney was a stage upon which mother and brother and kitty the maid at little will's bidding with will himself played a part a stage where virtue in other words will with the parcel gilt goblet upside down upon his head for crown ever triumphed over vice in the person of dull kitty with her knitting on the stool or where according to the play in turn noah or abraham or jesus christ walked in heaven while herod or pilate cain or judas burned in yawning hell end of chapter five chapter six of a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Bruce Kachuk. A Warwickshire Lad. The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. By George Madden Martin. Chapter 6. But as spring came, the garden offered a broader stage for life. The Shakespeare house was in Henley Street, and a fine house it was. Too fine, some held, for a man in John Shakespeare's circumstances two-storied of timber and plaster with dormer windows and a penthouse over its door and like its neighbours the house stood with a yard at the side and behind a garden of flowers and fruit and herbs and here the boy played the warm days through his mother stepping now and then to the lattice window to see what he was about and gazing often she saw him through tears because of a yearning love over him the more because of the two children dead before his coming and will seeing her there would tear into the house and drag her by the hand forth into the sweet rain-washed air and see mother he would tell her as he hailed her onto the sward beyond the arbor here it is the story you told us yestereen here is the ring where they danced last night the little folk and here is the glow-worm caught in the spider's web to give them light but something had changed mary shakespeare's mood john shakespeare chief bailiff and burgess of stratford was being sued for an old debt and one which mary shakespeare had been allowed to think was paid 
thereupon came to light other outstanding debts of which she had not known which must be met john shakespeare with irons in so many fires seemed forever to have put money out in ventures in leather in wool in corn in timber and to have drawn none in and now he talked of a mortgage on the aspies estate never mary told herself with a look at little will a toddling gilbert at her feet with a thought for the unborn child soon to add another inmate to the household not with my consent when the time comes they are grown what will be left for them she was bitter about the secrecy of those debts incurred unknown to her and yet to set herself against john wandering with the children down the garden path idly she plucked a red rose and laid its cheek against a white one already in her hand a kingdom divided against itself she sighed then became conscious of the boy pulling at her sleeve tell us a story mother he was begging a story with fighting and a sword a story will with fighting and a sword never yet could she say the child nay she held her roses from her and pondered while she gazed and her heart was bitter there was an arden child whose blood is in your veins who fought and fell at barnet crying shrill and fierce edward my king st george and victory and the young edward near him as he fell called to a knight to lay hand to his heart for edward knew and loved him well and had received of him money for a long forgotten debt which young edward's father would not press so edward called to a knight to lay hand upon his heart but he was dead a soldier and a knight said he who was afterward the king and more an honest man then she pushed the boy aside and going swiftly to the house ran to her room and face laid in her hands she wept what had she said in the bitterness of her feeling what even to herself had she said yet money must be had she admitted that but to encumber the estate she shrank from her own people knowing she had inherited more of her father's estate than her sisters and there had been feeling and her brothers-in-law lambert and webb would be but upheld in their prophecies about her husband's capacity to care for her property she would not have them know talk it over first with your father john she told her husband or with your brother henry let us not rush blindly into this thing you had promised anyhow you remember to take will out to the sheep shearing End of chapter 6chapter seven of a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by bruce kachuk a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare by george madden martin chapter seven so the next morning john shakespeare swung will up on the horse before him and the two rode away through the chill mistiness of the dawn will kissing his hand back to mother in the doorway bound for grandfather's at snitterfield they were so out through the town past the scattering homesteads with their gardens and orchards travelled robin the stout grey cob small will's chattering voice as high piped as the bird calls through the dawn on into the open country of meadows and cultivated fields the mists lifting rosy before the coming sun through lanes with mossy banks cobwebs spun between the blooming hedgerows heavy with dew over the hills past the straggling ash and hawthorn of the dingles and everywhere the cold moist scent of dawn and peep and call of nest birds and so early has been their start and so good stout robin's pace that reaching the snitterfield farm they find everything in the hurly-burly of preparation for sheep shearing so after a hearty kissing by the women folk aunts and cousins will with a cake hot from the baking thrust into his hand 
goes out to the steading to look around at snitterfield there are poultry and calves too in the byre and little pigs in the pen back of the barn then comes breakfast in the kitchen with the farmhands with their clattering hobnailed shoes and tarry hands after which follows the business of sheep washing which will views from the shady bank of the pool and in his small heart he is quite torn because of the plaintive bleatings of the frightened sheep but he swallows it as a man should there is a peddler haunting the sheep shearing festivals of the neighborhood the women have sent for him to bring his pack to snitterfield and dad bids will choose a pair of scented gloves for mother and be quick they must be off for stratford before the noon dad seems short and curt grandfather his broad florid face upturned to dad astride robin shakes his hoary head don't you do it son john says grandfather tis a building on sand is any man who thinks to prosper on a mortgage henry and i'll advance you a bit after which cut down your living in henley street son john and draw in the purse strings End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. A Warwickshire Lad: The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare by George Madden Martin. Chapter Eight but baby years pass when will shakespeare is six he hears that he is to go to school but not to nod over a horn-book at the petty school not john shakespeare's son little will shakespeare is entered at king's new college which is a grammar school but dear me dear me it was a dreary place and irksome at first small will sat among his kind awed when schoolmaster breathed will breathed but when schoolmaster glanced frowningly up from under overhanging brows like penthouse roofs then the heart of will shakespeare quaked within him but that was while he was six at seven when the elements of latin grammar confronted him will had already found grammar school an excellent place to plead aching tooth or heavy head to stay away from at eight a dreary travelling for him to cover did his sententiae puerilis prove and idle paths more pleasing at nine he had learned to know many things not listed at grammar school for instance he knew one bardolph of the brazen fiery nose the tapster at the tavern it was bardolph who drew him out from under the knee and belabouring fists of one thomas chettle another grammar school boy who had him down behind high cross in the rother market in the devil's name said bardolph setting him on his feet with your nose all gore and never an eye you can open what do you mean boy to be letting the like of that come over you that meant thomas chettle his fists squared and as red as any fighting turkey held off at arm's length by bardolph come over me cries will with a rush at thomas head down for all his being held off by bardolph's other hand who says he has come over me now the matter stood thus the day before will shakespeare had followed a company of strolling mountebanks about town instead of going to school and thomas chettle had told schoolmaster and he had told father when will reached home the evening before dad was telling as much to mother and blaming her for it and chettle's lad admits will had ever rather see the swords and hear a drum than look upon his lessons this father was saying as will sidled in will heard him say it and so thomas chettle had to answer for it come over me says will to bardolph who was holding him off and contemplating him a battered wreck come over me spitting blood and drawing a sleeve across his gory countenance i'd like to see him do it will shakespeare was not one to know when he was beaten end of chapter eight
Chapter 9 of A Warwickshire Lad The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. A Warwickshire Lad The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare by George Madden Martin. Chapter 9 a year or two more and school grew more irksome father fumed and mother sighed and drew will against her knee whereon lay new little sister anne while little sister joan toddled about the floor canst not seem to care for your books at all son mother asked brushing will's red-brown hair out of his eyes canst not see how it frets father who would have his oldest son a scholar and a gentleman he meant to try, but hadn't Dad himself let him off one day to tramp at heels after him and Uncle Henry in Arden Forest? Will Shakespeare at eleven is a sorry student. There comes a day when he is a big boy near thirteen years old. It is a time when the soft hot winds of spring and the scent and the pulse of growing things get in the blood and set one sick panting for the woods and the feel of the lush green underfoot and the sound of running water not that will shakespeare can put it into words he only knows that when the smell of the warm newly turned earth comes in at the schoolroom window and the hum of a wandering bee rises above the droning of the lesson he lolls on the hacked and ink-stained desk and gazes out at the white clouds flecking the blue and all the truant blood in his sturdy frame falls against his promises then at length comes a day when the madness is strong upon him and he hides his books his cato's maxims or perchance his confabula shodis poor aurelis under the garden hedge and skirting the town makes his way along the river and there hidden among the willows and green alders and rustling sedge he spends the morning and when in the heat of the day the fish refuse to nibble he takes his hunk of bread out of his pocket and lies on his back among the rushes while lazy dreams flit across his consciousness as the light summer clouds rock mistily across the blue and the wandering madness still upon him in the afternoon he skirts about and tramps toward shottery it is no new thing to go to shottery with or without mother for a day at the hathaways there always has been rebellion in the blood of will shakespeare and there is a slender wayward grown-up somebody at shottery who understands anne hathaway has stayed often in stratford with the shakespeare household mother loves anne father teases and twits her the young men swains and would-be sweethearts swarm about her like bumblebees about the honeysuckle at the garden gate and when she is there will himself seldom leaves her side he has oft been a rebellious boy whereat mother has sighed and father has sworn but anne staying with them and she alone has laughed she has understood and there have been times when this tall brown-haired young person has seized his hand as if she too had moments of rebellion and the two have run away away from the swains and the would-be sweethearts the latin grammar and the scoldings to wonder about the river banks and the lanes end of chapter nine chapter ten of a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. A Warwickshire Lad. The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare. By George Madden Martin. Chapter 10. So this afternoon, Will tramped off to Shottery. There was a consciousness in the back of his mind of wonderful leafiness and embowering of vines and riotous bloom about anne's home he opened the wicket and trudged up the path and peered in at the open door anne within the doorway saw him 
she looked him in the eye then up at the sun yet high in the sky and laughed and he knew she understood it truancy perhaps she understood more than the fact perhaps she understood the feeling she threw her work aside needle stuck therein and clapped a wide straw hat upon her head and taking his hand dragged him down the path and at the gate and away along the evesome road but she lectured him nevertheless this red-cheeked boy with the full as yet undisciplined young mouth and the clear warm hazel eyes you tell me that i too throw my work down and run away i will there's that hot blood within me that sweeps me out every now and then from within tame walls and from stupid people and makes me know it is true the old tale of some wild gypsy blood brought home by a soldier hathaway for wife but there is this difference if you please sir i throw down my work because i have fought my fight and conquered it am mistress of what i will in my household craft think you that i love the moulding of butter and the care of poultry or to spin to cut to sew because i do them and do them well it is not the thing i love will it is in the victory i find the joy i would conquer them to feel my power conquer your book will stride ahead of your class then play your fill till they arrive abreast of you again but a laggard a stupid or a middling and in faith the last is worst they walked along boy and young woman she musing he looking up with young ardor into her face you you are so beautiful anne the boy blurted forth and and no one understands as you do she laid a hand on his shoulder and turned her dark eyes upon him teasing eyes they could be and mocking yet sweet too ah sweet and tender through their laughter shall i tell you why i understand will shakespeare child was she talking altogether to the boy or above his head aloud as to herself i am a woman will and at nineteen most such are already wife and mother and i am still unwed shall i tell you why we are but souls wandering and lonely in the dark will other souls everywhere around but scarce a groping hand that ever meets or touches our outstretched own in all life we feel one such touch perchance or two the rest we know no more than if they were not there my father great simple countryman's soul i knew will and mary shakespeare i know would she might learn she could do more with john through laughter dear heart but the right is ever stronger with mary than the humour of the thing my father and mary i have known and you you i knew when in your rage you fell upon the maid baby that you were at five and beat her with your fists because she wantonly swept your treasures a rose petal a beetle wing a pebble a feather into her kitchen fire i knew you then for so i had been beating at fate my life long i knew you will and dear child always since i have watched and understood rebel if you will be free but to be free forget not is to be conqueror over that within self first will caught her hand he whispered his voice burned hot with a child's jealousy tis said you are to wed abraham stripling anne and that the foreign doctor who wants to wed you broke abram's head with his pestle anne hathaway laughed her eyes were mocking now she backed against the lichen trunk of a giant elm by the roadside a young beauteous thing and looked at the boy in scorn i to marry abraham stripling child though you are you know me better than that did i not just tell you i am free now free that i have held fast to my duty and so come to where i might be free have held them at bay family cousins elders sweethearts until now the rest married and gone and the tasks as they gave them up come to be mine my mother needs me and my life may be my own and free for who has come to wed me did i not just say i was i am free a soul groping lonely in the dark 
no man's hand has reached toward mine that i a woman and a weakling could not shake off when the masterful hand groping seizes mine i shall know it and i i will kiss it with my lips and and follow after she came back to him as one from an ecstasy and now child go on home it is late and hurry or mary will be fretting you have had your cake and eaten it now go pay for it discipline must be maintained says your welsh schoolmaster and sure he will flog you End of chapter 10chapter eleven of a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce kachuk a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare by george madden martin chapter eleven but no one at home had missed him the henley street house was full of hurry and confusion when he arrived no one noticed him the neighbors came in and out mistress sadler and mistress snelling and the foreign doctor who would like to wed anne or passed on up to a room above where little sister annie named for anne hathaway lay dying of a sudden croup and all since morning since will stole away he knows this thing called life this deep inbreathing this joy of shout of run of leap of vault he knows strong healthy young animal he knows this thing but the other this strange thing called death the darkened room father with his head fallen on his breast standing at the lattice gazing out at nothing mother kneeling one arm outstretched across the bed her head fallen thereon and mistress sadler trying to raise and lead her away and this this waxen whiteness framed in flaxen baby rings on the pillow this little stiffening hand outside the linen cover will shakespeare cries out he has touched little sister annie's hand and it is cold End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Of a Warwickshire Lad The Story of the Boyhood of William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Bruce Kachuk A Warwickshire Lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare by george madden martin chapter twelve and after that things went worse in the shakespeare household all of john shakespeare's ventures were proving failures debt pressed on every side there began talk again of a mortgage on the aspies estate and this time none could say nay dad went about with his head sunk on his breast and at home sat staring in moody silence don't mary don't he would say to mother putting her hand on his shoulder take the children away instead of the name their father would have left them john shakespeare gentlemen they are to read it what john john said mother is there no more then in it all our love our lives than pride pride will shakespeare by now knew what it meant and his heart went out to his father he had felt the sting of this thing himself it had been the year before dad had taken him behind him on his horse to kenilworth to see the masks and fireworks given by the earl of leicester in the queen's honour the gay london people come down with the court had sat in stands and galleries to witness the spectacle of the water pageant breathing their perfumed breath down upon the country people crowding the ground below and will shakespeare among these at sight of the great queen 
had cheered with a lusty young throat and thrown his cap up with the rest will shakespeare was the once chief bailiff's son he was the son of mary arden of the aspies though he never had thought about it one way or another he had always known himself as good as the best and so at kenilworth standing with the crowd and looking up at the jewelled folk in fine array casting their jokes and jibes down at the trammel he had laughed too as honest as any but when the time came for the water pageant dad had given him a lift up and a boost to the branches of a tree and he had heard what she said the lady upon whom he had from the first fixed his young gaze the dark lady with the jewels in her dusky hair breathing lure and beauty and glamour as he straddled the limb of his high perch that brought him so near her he heard her cry out her head thrown backward on her proud young throat ah the little beast bringing the breath of the rabble up to our nostrils and it was something like to what burned in young will shakespeare's soul then that dad was feeling now will big boy that he was laid a hand on dad's hand father looked up their eyes met dad threw an arm about his shoulder and drew him close father and son something passed from the older to the younger the boy squared his shoulders the man in will shakespeare was born how best could he help dad so the lad pondered meanwhile digging the sense piecemeal out of his ovid for the morrow's lesson it is the mind that makes the man and our strength measure vigor any one of the three words would do our measure is in our immortal souls why why is there truth in books had ovid lived and been a man a man who knew and fought it out himself will shakespeare caught sight of a great and glorious kingdom he had not visioned before the schoolmaster hitherto had talked in riddles End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce kachuk a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare by george madden martin chapter thirteen yet a year after this will shakespeare just awakened to a love of letters threw his books down mother's brown hair as she leaned over her new child edmund showed lines of gray dad the day's trade over sat brooding at home and scarce would hie him forth the fear of process for debt hanging over him tall sturdy will shakespeare could buy up cattle and trade for hides as well as the butcher's son in rother market will shakespeare threw down his books and went forth into the world a man a man a man yes once his stripling days of hot blood are over days of rustic rout of fight and wrestle of deer stealing of wanderings with strolling players a man husband to anne hathaway father of children son of mary arden of the aspies gentlewoman of john shakespeare failure who would be gentleman a man this william shakespeare gone up to london to do a part in the world in the world this world wherein all is gain and nothing loss does one but make it so all is garnering all is treasure all if so one deem it is pageant poetry and drama the rustic the maid the gammer the tapster the schoolboy the master the lubber folk the witch the fairy the elf the goblin the fat woman of brentford the man dwelling by the churchyard snelling saddler bardolph clowder the old dog the mummer the wait the revel the cates and ale the player strutting the stage as herod 
the sheep shearing the peddler the glove the white rose and the red the princes in the tower st george and victory king knight soldier the avon sweetly flowing in its banks the forest the clouds rocking across the blue stripling the foreign doctor queen courtier lady love life death hope struggle despair pride ambition failure vision striving achievement wisdom philosophy contemplation into the world where all is gain and nothing loss does one make it so went william shakespeare of stratford to conquer end of chapter thirteen end of a warwickshire lad the story of the boyhood of william shakespeare by george madden martin